Welcome to my channel where you can learn about sewing and listen to the real horror stories shared by strangers. In this video, I'm sewing an orange dress. First, I choose a fabric. This one is fine. It's light and affordable. Then I cut the fabric into 4 long rectangle pieces, 1 piece for the top and 3 pieces for the skirt. Cut, cut, cut. There is no better self-care than cutting off people who are toxic for you. Let's hear a story of a woman who was once being paranoid and depressed. I didn't think I had anything really creepy to pose about until I started reading through them and read something similar to an experience I had. It started around my sophomore year in high school. I began getting creepy texts and phone calls but never really thought that much of them since in those days prank calls was a common thing to do. The messages and calls would come in consistently for a few weeks then would stop after a while. I honestly would forget they had even happened until they'd started back again. Around my junior year, the calls began getting creepier. They would call my house number along with a cell phone. This was around the time cell phones were starting to get popular. So while some of my older friends still had my house number, it wasn't something I would give out to people anymore. When I started dating, they began calling my then boyfriend and would tell him awful things about me and sometimes even know where I was at the time and ask him to question my whereabouts. It caused a lot of issues between us but again they would stop after a while and apart from wondering who it could be, I never thought that much of them again. Fast forward to college, I stopped talking to a lot of my friends from high school even deleted all my space account and cleared friends from Facebook because I wanted to have a fresh start. Was still dating the same guy but really stopped having contact with most of the people I know from high school. Halfway through my freshman year of college, the calls and text messages started again, this time with even more personal details about my life. Like always, Right before I considered them serious enough to report, they would stop and I would slowly forget that it even happened. During my second year in college, I moved out of the dorms and into an apartment with three girls I met the year before. One night, I started getting usual texts again, but this time, they were threatening to photoshop nude pictures of me to send out to people I know. I tried ignoring them, but the texts wouldn't stop. I would block one number and they would come in from a different number almost immediately. I got really creeped out and decided to change my number the next day. At this point, I was not sure who it was but I became paranoid and stopped trusting anyone except my boyfriend. I isolated myself from friends and began to go into depression. I sometimes was sure it was so and so from high school but could never come up with proof of anything. Fast forward, a few months and I'm at a concert with my boyfriend. He got drunk that night and we got into a huge fight over it. I was home with my parents that weekend and got home around midnight. Around 2 a.m., the calls to my house phone started coming in. Yes, we still had a landline. One after another, we were getting calls from men asking for my sexual services. We tried blocking calls, but like before, it was just different numbers, one after another. Finally, we just unplugged the phone. The next morning, I had to explain to my parents what had been going on for years, and together we made a report and changed our landline number. Turns out, someone had put my phone number on Craigslist and listed me as a prostitute. By now, I finally began realizing that my boyfriend had been the one constant during most of these incidents and that our drunk fight that night could not have been a coincidence with my number being posted on Craigslist. 
it took a few tries for me to leave the relationship. He was very manipulative. I had spent years isolating myself from friendships and trusting only him. I finally left him that summer and chose to forget all of these things had ever happened. It took me a while to be healthy enough to start dating again. But when I did, I met a wonderful guy who is now my husband. I mentioned what had happened to me before but thankfully was emotionally distant enough from it that we just commented on how awful that had been and move on. Last year, however, I began getting text messages again. I had a new phone, new number, new friend circle, block anyone associated with the ex-boyfriend, trusted the people in my life not to hand out my number to anyone, so I was so scared when it started again. Thankfully, this time, I had my wonderful husband with me. After it happened, a few times where I would get text messages, only when I was with my husband and the text insinuated that I had been cheating on him, we decided that we weren't going to take the chance that it was coincidence. We hoped that we weren't being followed, but the timing and content of the messages were obviously meant to cause a fight between my husband and I. We decided to make another police report, this time citing my ex-boyfriend as a suspect and once again changed my number and limited the people who had my number even further. Since then, I am happy to say that I have not gotten any unknown calls or messages. The detective assigned to my case attempted to contact my ex-boyfriend but he was never able to. In any case, I think that he realized that this time I was serious about pursuing legal action against him and he stopped. I was lucky that this was the case because technically, I did not have proof that it had been him. Anonymous harassment is actually really difficult to pursue legally for many reasons, so thankfully approaching him was enough to make it stop. When I think about this experience now, I realize how disturbed and manipulative that guy really was. I have no proof that the prank calls I got before I met him were him. But if I think about how I met him, it just all looks so planned to me now. I hope that those calls were coincidence, but I really never know how far this guy went with his talking of me. I'm just glad to be out of that relationship and to be emotionally healthy again. Moving on to making the pop sleeves. The same thing as making rectangles. Measure the width like this. And the length, measure to how long you want your sleeves. It kinda looks like this when done sewing the garter. See, just do the same with the bottom. Before sewing the garter, cut the side seams with the measure of your upper chest to lower armpit. Mark it with a sewing chalk and cut. Then sew this area. Because I don't have a serger, I just double sew it with zigzag stitch. Then I'm cutting the edges using a pinking shears. Double fold and sew. I mark the lower area of the pop sleeves where I'm going to insert the garter. I'm using the same length of fabric with 1.5 inches width. Then I carefully place it on the mark area. Don't forget to leave a hole for a garter to insert later. Double fold this for at least 1 cm for another garter to insert. Mm -hmm. 
My boss tried to give a helping pause, but I said no. Thank you. And we're done making our pop sleeves. Simple as that. Anybody can do it. Sometimes you overthink things so much that you ruin something before it even begins. Then you beat yourself up, replaying everything to your friends and in your mind. Let's hear a scary story of a person who was once a little boy. When I was about 8 years old, during recess at school, I noticed a bunch of other kids outside a storage room yelling and warning to others not to approach the door because there was an eyeball staring back at you. I was curious because I didn't understand what they meant but I could see their fear was real because their faces were pale white as they would try to deter me from taking a peek through the K-hole. I remember bending down slightly so I could get a closer look inside and sure enough, there was an eyeball staring back at me and it freaked me out so much I peed my pants on the spot. It was only later in the day after I had ended up at the nurse's office because of the commotion us kids had created. That the janitor had to go into the room to inspect what this whole mess was about. Turns out that someone had placed a mirror against that door and the eyeball we were seeing was our own reflection. Making the shared top is easy. You just need to cut a long rectangle with the width of your bus circumference and multiply it to 1.8 or 2 normally. Because I have a very light fabric, I multiply it to 4. The length is measured from your upper chest to waist. I cut it half to make two pieces. This cut area, I just used the same method. I hem the upper area nice and neat. I'm using elastic thread on my bobbin. Now it's time to do the sharing. Just use the side seams as your guide. After that, use the first hair draw as your new guide and so on. Keep going until it's done. Lightly iron your project to shrink it up a bit for a better fit. I did the same with the other two. Now. Set aside this and leave it there. Set aside and leave it there. Let's hear the disturbing story of a person who was once vulnerable. I was outside playing with friends one afternoon. We were around 9 or 10. We live in a quiet area. As we were playing, we noticed a man in a truck driving by over and over again. Each time he passed my friend's yard, he would drive slowly. We didn't realize that this man was recording us with one of those old handheld recording camera. It freaked us out. We ran inside their house and called his mom. My friend's mother told me that they needed to stay inside and that I should go home. 
I tried explaining that my mom wasn't home at that moment, but she still made me leave. I live about a mile or two down the road. I've never run so fast in my life. I was terrified that man was going to find me as I was running back home. When my mom found out what happened, she was super pissed off my friend's mom hadn't allowed me to stay at their house until she could come and pick me up. I got two long rectangles for the belt, 24 inches length and 6 inches width. I fold them and sew. Then I simply turned them right side out using a stick and pressed them flat with the iron. Now I place and pin the belt to the waist area of the shared top like a sandwich. And so. That's it. Very easy. Now I'm attaching the pop sleeves. And we are done, making the shirt top pop sleeves. Pop sleeves. Have you watched the first Scream movie where Drew Barrymore is preparing her popcorn in the kitchen? Well, let's hear the horror story of a woman who was horrified in her kitchen. This was a few months after I had moved into my house. I had a long weekend and I was at home just doing some cleaning and cooking. While my food was in the oven, I decided to go for a quick shower. I was drying off when I heard the beep 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 sound of my oven timer, letting me know it was time to take the food out. I wrapped myself in a towel and went into the kitchen. I get the food out, started some sides going, and then went back to clean up in the bathroom and get dressed. When I walked back into the kitchen, I noticed there was a small blood splatter on my white tiled floor. Naturally, I freaked the f out. I waved around and walked right the f out of the house because my mind was instantly filled with ideas of someone breaking in and cutting their leg on the broken window glass and then hiding out somewhere in my house waiting to rape and murder me when I least expected it. I called my then boyfriend to tell him that I thought someone was in my house, something weird had happened in my house. He was at work and couldn't come. So I called my neighbor, told her the situation, and asked her to please come over for a while. She agreed that the blood spot was very strange, and together, we grabbed knives and slowly creaked open the doors to the extra bedrooms and the closets. No one was there. At that point, I became convinced that they had to be hiding in the basement and starting shitting myself because my basement is huge and scary as f We go down and brace for the worst, but there's nothing there but boxes and spiders. After not finding or hearing anything strange, I calm down. My neighbor left and I clean up the blood. I told my boyfriend, I was fine and tried to just go about having a normal day, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. I didn't hallucinate the blood on my floor. It was really there. How the hell did it get there? Was there a bad guy somewhere close to my house? What happened? Did I have a mouse that jumped from the counter and injured itself when it hit the floor? A few hours later, 
I used the bathroom and noticed that I had started my period. I was really embarrassed and ashamed when I connected the dots and realized that when I squatted down to take my food out of the oven, I must have dripped a drop of blood on the floor. Moving to skirt is even more easy. You just need three pieces of long rectangles. The first layer, the second, and the third. Then I gathered the second layer by using a loose seam stitches. Then I pin the second layer to the first layer, and so I did the same method for the third layer. Now I'm gathering the first layer. And pin the side seams of the skirt. And so. Almost done, I'm attaching the skirt to the shirt top, as usual, pin and sew. And hem this area. Finally, the orange flowy dress is done. Flowy dress. Sometimes, you just need to go with the flow, but how can you when you're in a terrifying situation? Let's hear the story of a person who was once a child, scared and horrified. My parents sent me to live with my grandmother when I was seven. They had to work in another city for a couple of months while waiting for my big brother to finish middle school. I was static to live at my grandma's since she would spoil the hell out of me. She lived in a two-bedroom house with four of my aunts and my uncle. However, three of my aunts and me slept piled in one bedroom while my uncle and grandma slept in the living room. The reason? One of my aunts was schizophrenic and had a whole bedroom to herself. My aunt had been crazy for years. My grandma wasn't the best making her take her pills and she would spend hours talking to herself and drawing with crayons on the wall. Looking back, it's creepy as hell. But as a child, I was having the blast living in the house where I was the most sane person around. This ended rather abruptly when I woke up with my crazy aunt pointing some scissors at my neck. The most plausible story is that she wanted to cut one of my hair strands as she had picked this habit of cutting hair for a couple of months. However, we never knew for sure. Almost immediately, my parents picked me up and moved to a very old house where earthworms came out of the toilet and shower drain at night. As a child, I thought I had walked into a living nightmare. Before I'm going to tell the last horror story of this episode, let's see how the dress looks on me. I like it, it's very comfortable. Very comfortable. That someone makes you feel comfortable? But how can you still be comfortable knowing the intention of that someone? Let's hear the disturbing story of a man who was once a child and confused. In third grade, I had this strange, short teacher named Mrs. Dodd. She was always super nice to me in class. 
She'd always call on me to do the fun activities first, compliment me whenever I did something, and was generally just very positive towards me. At the time, I thought she was perhaps my favorite person in the world. I remember even telling my mother about how much I loved Mrs. Todd. Anyways, one day, I sat down at my desk and opened it up to put crap in it when shockingly, I saw that there was a Victoria's Secret magazine sitting in the pull-out drawer. The kids sitting next to me noticed how shocked I was. I thought I was going to get in trouble and we started talking about how it might have got there. Almost immediately, Mrs. Toad woke up as, What have you got there? I was seriously confused and told her it was sitting in my desk when I got here this morning. Well, she looks at me and tells me that the kid sitting next to me must have put it there. She kept repeating that statement to both him and me until I finally admitted that I guess he could have put it there. Maybe a few days after that, she approached me after class to tell me about this special field trip I could go on if I kept doing good in class. It would be a trip with just her and I to the Gulf of Mexico for the weekend. I remember being really excited about it at that time. However, suddenly she got replaced at the school and we got this new teacher that didn't like me as much. I was so heartbroken at the time. It wasn't until many years later that I realized how f up the situation was. It scares me thinking about it still. <laughs>